CYC is a free channel presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. Um, I was asked to speak about a verse from Proverbs 31, uh, chapter 31, verse 10. Far above rubies. He's talking about the virtuous wife or the virtuous woman that we are. Not just like rubies, but far above rubies. We all know what rubies are, right? No? Okay, we'll get to see it in a minute. It's a very precious gem precious stone. But we don't live in an ideal world, we don't live in a perfect world, so it's going to be very difficult sometimes to be far above rubies as God expected us to be. So the goal of this lecture is that to define what is a godly woman. So I sat and I thought about it. I'm like, well, first let me figure out how to be a godly man. Because whatever I need to pass on, this is what I need to learn. And I found that I realized that it's going to be a very, very long lecture if we figure out how to be a godly man or woman. So we're going to try to, to just to touch upon a few points that we, we notice that we are faced with many challenges and how to become a godly woman and face all these challenges that we face on a day-to-day basis. So some of these challenges, the fact that we're always trying to fit in. And maybe you guys could speak to this more than I do and more than anyone else. But we're, the biggest struggle that we have that we always try to fit in. We always try to dress like everyone else dresses. We always try to do our hair just like the, you know, the movie stars and everyone that we see on ads like Sayyidina was talking yesterday. We're always trying to imitate society and we're always trying very hard to fit in in society. But it becomes very difficult because, you know, a lot of things that we want to do or it's not necessarily what's good for us. The friends that we're tempted to wanting to, be, to fit in with them is probably not the best friends that we want to be around. The style that I want to dress in is probably not the best style that I should be dressing in. Or the things that I'm... Um, supposed to watch so I don't feel left out when my friends talk about the different reality shows that they watch on MTV or whatever shows they watch and I'm trying to fit in and I know it's probably not the most proper thing to watch but I'm doing it anyway just to fit in which brings us to a very s- dangerous stage that I see danger in this uh, group or this thing that I want to do And I see it, and I'm aware of it, but I'm willing to take the risk anyway, just so I fit in. Just so I'm called part of the group, or to become one of those friends, the school friends. Or just to say that no one will make fun of uh, the way I dress, or the way I talk, or the way I walk, or the relationships that I have. Or many, many things we could think about. Um, And this adds to our pressure or we all live in which is peer pressure peer pressure and I was speaking to some of you to give me some hints about what are some of the peer pressure that girls go through and probably the biggest thing that stands out is like we said trying to fit in and um, trying to just going with the flow just I don't feel this pressure around me so everything that I simply, everything that's simply around me is, or I want to do and I want to imitate just because everyone else is doing it. And this brings us to the most dangerous uh, point that we could, or most dangerous pressure that we fall into, trying to please others. Trying to please others is like, can you ever play a game that doesn't end? I know we played one on the van on the way here and I almost wanted to jump out of the window, but (laughs) you ever play this game, a game that doesn't end? This is a game that if we start playing this game trying to please others, 
is going to be devastating in the end. It's going to be detrimental to our life and to maybe even to the life of others around us and to our families. So this is a game we don't want to, to start. We don't want to start playing this game because it will really ruin our image, which we will ruin the image that God created us. And as Sayyidina taught us, we were created in the image of God. I just want to demonstrate something that a lot of us do struggle with is that we base and we measure our life based on the eyes of others. Whatever others think of us, this is how we measure ourselves. Whatever guys look at us and measure our beauty, this is how we think we are beautiful. We look through their eyes and to the eyes of society to look back at ourselves. I'm going to show you something, but promise don't laugh. I was trying to find a ruby. This is the best thing I was able to find. I said no left. So, looks enough, close enough to a ruby, right? <laughs> Just disregard it's a lollipop. Okay. So if I ask one of you girls, this is a hundred million dollar ruby. And it's yours. And I give it to you. But it's a very valuable ruby. And it's been in the family for many, many years, and don't get rid of it, and it's yours. And I was going to do a little play, but we're running out of time. But. And all of a sudden, you come across this six-foot-two, blonde hair, blue eyes, guys, <laughs> nice teeth, white, they're actually white, broad <laughs> shoulders. And he comes to you and goes, you know, would you give me this ruby? I said, no, no way. It's very precious to me. How about I give you $10 for it? What would you say? No, no, no way, right? Then he started becoming this really sweet guy. You know, I noticed you changed your hairdo. <laughs> then all of a sudden you soften a little bit. He didn't even say I like it, I just said I noticed. In his mind he could be saying that, what did she do to herself? That I don't know, she should go back to whatever she did before. But all of a sudden he's God's gift on earth. Just because he said something nice. God forbid he does one of these corny pickup lines like, I heard this, um, pick, I, you know, sometimes we have these small talk with guys like, one of the pickup lines like, is your, God, is your father a thief? No, why? Because he must have stole all the stars and put it in your eyes. <laughs> you know, I'm like, if this is the best you could do, we have a problem. But the problem is we fall for these things. And all of a sudden, we end up giving, us, giving this person this ruby, and he puts a price on it, not the way it values. And based on what he sees from his eyes, this is how I see myself. Imagine I see myself through someone else's eyes. I see myself through what, how society sees me and how society perceives me and my values. Unfortunately, we fall into this trap and we measure ourselves based on how society sees us and based how other people see us and based specifically how guys look at us. If he says, eh, she's okay, then in my eyes, I'm okay. If, she's, if he says she needs to dress up a little bit more, I'm gonna dress up a little bit more. She needs more makeup, I'm gonna add more makeup. If she needs to cut her hair, I'm gonna cut my hair. But this is a big problem, and I didn't figure this out myself. It wasn't, f I talked to some of you guys that really they struggle, and you guys struggle from this point, that we're trying to please people. With Sadness permission, a quick joke. Uh, a married couple, the woman standing in front of the mirror. After many years of marriage, she goes, you know, she's telling her husband, you stop telling me how beautiful I am, like you used to tell me when we were engaged or before we were engaged. And he stopped telling me, you know, you look pretty and you, all these good things. So he said, he turns around, he goes, honey, you have the best vision there is. You don't get it. No, never mind. <laughs> he was trying to compliment to her. She's looking in the mirror. Okay. Ah. Okay, so much for jokes.
Okay. So, I explained the jokes. Okay. Uh, this woman is looking at the mirror. She sees herself not pretty. So she wants to hear compliments of her husband. But the way he complimented her about her vision that she sees very well. You get it? Okay, maybe I'll change in Chinese so you can get it. I don't know. Sorry, it's a... Uh... I thought it was me, but Sayyidna got it, so I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go back on track. I got it the first time, but I felt like they didn't understand, so you have to... I, 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 I thought I was getting old with my jokes, but Sayyidna got it, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, let's blame it on lunch. <clears throat> so, before we go on, let us... You know, describe what is or the or different characteristics of a ruby that we're talking about. But remember, what is the title say? Or what is the verse says? Or what? Far above ruby. So even we're going to describe the rubies, but we're far above that. Far above that. But let's just, for argument's sake, it's an expensive type. Precious stone, obviously, just like the rest of the stone, sapphire and diamonds and something, some rocks that everybody in this room dreams for. Um, it's very expensive. And sometimes some of these stones are priceless. It's very beautiful. It's very precious. Whoever owns this, this means a lot to them, especially if it's passed on from one generation to another or was given from a very special person and is very honorable, full of integrity. It's something that I value very much when I own it. So I want you to remember this slide because we're going to come back to it all the way to the end. Again, since we don't live in a perfect world, eventually some things will happen in my life or I will do things that kind of ruins the image of this uh, ruby. Or, yani, obviously, figure out by now, this means us. So, just a quick demonstration. Or you could tell me, what are some of the things that could ruin this image? Let's say we shut all the lights here. And here's the ruby, imagine. Is it here? Yes or no? Yeah. It's not a hard question. <laughs> yes? Okay, good. Can you see it? No, because no, it's dark. Second demonstration. Pile of dirt. And I put it in the dirt. I'm not going to put it because some of you might want it. Yeah. Yeah. Want it <laughs> huh? Okay. After I put it in the dirt or before? Okay. <laughs> I put it in the dirt. Is it still there or not? Yes. But can you see it? No. Even if I can, it's filthy. And if I take a hammer and crush this, it's still there but in a million pieces. It serves no value. It lost all its value. If you know anything about diamonds, which I'm sure you know everything about diamonds, <laughs> the bigger the stone in one piece, the more value it has, right? Just like any precious stone. So three quick things that could prevent us or ruins the image of this beautiful stone or beautiful image that we were created according. So one is darkness. Two is where I'm going to call it digging it in dirt. Three is crushing the stone. Darkness. What is darkness? Darkness is what? Absence of, Absence of light. Very good. There's no switch that I could turn on and all of a sudden this room becomes dark. No, this room becomes dark when there is no light. So, why would I ever walk in darkness? A couple reasons. Well, one of the main reasons is that we move away from the grace of God. We drift away from the grace of God. And this happens because another reason is when we something else other than God leads our life. When what? Something other than God leads our life. It obviously is going to lead us towards the dark side, not towards the light. Because God only is the true light. 
So if anything other than God leading, leading our life, it becomes darkness. And I wish Abuna Moises was here because I, he said an analogy about six years ago. Parsinia, maybe you could tell him. Uh, about what does it mean by yani, uh, letting someone else lead in our life. So I kind of yani, searched online and I found this picture. What, what do you see other than lemons? What do you see? Honest. Yani, describe what you're seeing. Now let's start from the top. A donkey. Okay. I call it, instead of a 260 horsepower, I call it one donkey power. Pickup truck. What else do you see? A guy who's sleeping, not tired. He's sleeping. Do you see his eyes? Like doing any, he's sleeping. A boy in the back, in the middle of the highway, cars all around. What does that mean? Thank you. The donkey's leading. So how does this happen? Um, every day, this farmer or this man goes to the market, sells stuff, and the donkey knows his way back. So he, whether he sleeps or not, he's going to get home. But if, God forbid, a bus came and hits this person, or somebody pulled this donkey in a different direction, whose life... Like, the man and his son, their life is at whose hands? If He has four, by the way. <laughs> the donkey. So, this life, these two lives are led by one or by an animal. Something that maybe has no reasoning. But sometimes we do the same exact thing when we let other things other than God lead our life. We take our whole life, put it into their hands, whether it's friends, whether it's media, whether it's society, and lead us into whatever direction it goes. Whatever happens, happens. As long as I fit in, as long as I am cool in society. Is cool still a cool world? Is it? Or I'm dating myself. Okay. So the question for me is, who is driving my life? Who is leading my life? Is it society and things of society? I mean, we could talk about this for a very long time. And Sayyidna said a very key word that who determines if I'm beautiful or not? Who determines if I, am, I have this beauty or how do I live my life? It's not society. If I depend on society, I'm going to be just like this game that doesn't end. I'm going to always try to please people. Then I'm going to end up in a very devastating state. Who's leading my life? Is it media? And unfortunately, how many people watch? You don't have to raise your hand, so spare the embarrassment. MTV. Call out some of the names of shows on MTV. Okay. What? Oh, I, that's new to me. So. What? There's no good, put it this way, there's no good show on MTV. Is there? All the rally shows, except uh, Restaurant Impossible, is a decent show. All these are immoral shows, whether we like it or not, but we, this is what the media is offering us. Not to mention everything else in the media, not to spend a lot of time on it. Who is leading? Is it my friends and my peers? Is it whatever my friends do, I do? Wherever they go, I go? Do I have a, a say in my life? Whether I do or don't, or say or not to say, or dress or not to dress? Who is leading? Who determines the, whether we go to this party or not? Is it me or others? Or is it me or my peers? Who determines that I should dress like this or talk like this or have a relation, this type of relationship? I think you know what I'm talking about. Who is leading? Is it my habits? Because sometimes we allow ourselves and we allow these habits to come into our life slowly but surely without taking any action against it. And all of a sudden these habits are taking over. One of the biggest habit, uh, habits that we have, Yani, is the computer and computer issues without going into much details. One of the biggest habits. I heard one of the, Yani, uh, Dr. Nabil Bay, you know who he is? He's a famous counselor from California and he has a 50 year experience. He said something very striking to me. He said, if they give my son, his own son, biological son, a choice between being addicted to 
cocaine or pornography, he rather picks cocaine. Why? Eventually, you could, if you want to change from a cocaine habit, you could get it out of your system. Yani, if you want. But how do you get bad images out of your mind? It's a very, very long road, very yani, tough road. You can't get these images out of your mind. It's very easily addicting because it's free, it's easy, it's on our phones, it's everywhere we go. And everyone does it. And there's no shame in, in, in doing it because, the, who, again, who sets the measures? Society sets the measures. And this is the three-letter word that sells. Again, who is leading? Is it the person I'm in a relationship and this not quote-unquote proper relationship? Is he leading this life of mine? And we could go on and on and on. So anything other than God will lead me. We'll start from the inside first. I mean, from the outside first. Then it will start leading from the inside. And all of a sudden, I'm living in darkness. And my life is destroyed. But if we allow God to live, I mean, to lead our life, He will lead us from the inside. Then eventually, this will edify my whole life, not just my inside or my outside. Overcoming darkness, very quick. So what do I do? Become children of light. If I don't want to live in darkness, I live in light. How do I live in light? Let's read together. Whenever we see anything in red, let's read it together so we could get familiar with the verses. This is the message which we have what God is light and Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have the fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And I think it goes without saying, and this is a whole lecture in itself, how do we walk in the light? How do we follow the light? God gave us, we say in the liturgy, and He was incarnated and became man, and He taught us the ways of salvation. He gave us ways, and He gave us many ways on how to, to walk in the light inside the four walls of the church, being connected on a daily basis with the Word of God and my relationship with God in my prayers. Many, many things that will lead us into walk to become children of light. And this is, remember I told you, I thank Sayyidina for teaching us a lot of things. One of the two things that always will live with me forever, two things I learned here in ECCYC. I remember Amba Musa standing and saying, dare to be different. And I remember him pointing at us, dare to be different. Can we be different? Are we afraid to be different? Because we are not followers, we are what? And this is one of the best things. Yeah, we learned a lot, but the thing that really stands out that helped me growing up is these two statements I learned here in ECCYC. Dare to be different. I dare you to be different. I dare you to be a follower, I mean a leader, not a follower. I was born to be a leader, not a follower. I like this t-shirt. And as the book of Proverbs 4, 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. To mankind, every, this thing could be the right thing, but it would lead to death. But if we're different, and we follow the way, and we walk in the way of the light, there is life. Like we said, choose your environment, and don't let the environment choose you. Don't let the environment just pick you up and take you wherever it goes. No, you choose where to go, what to wear, what to do, what not to do. The next point is when we dig this precious stone, in dirt, we cannot see it, and even if we do, it's filthy. So what does this mean to us? This means when I introduce new habits in my life, I add this dirt in my life. I make this precious stone that God, wants, that God created me and wants me to continue to live 
just as he created me from the beginning to be this way. But it will prevent me from being that way as long as I am freely introducing whatever habit comes in my way without doing or taking any actions about it. This means when I allow myself to do whatever it takes to fit in. Whatever it takes just to fit in. And we could put a huge blank spot and we fill in by whatever it takes in my mind. Think about what do I do or what do I struggle with, try to do in order to fit in. This means when I live a life without discernment or discretion. And one day in, one day out, whatever happens, happens. And whatever society tells me to dress, I'm going to dress. No discernment in the places I go or the things that I do. No discretion in any relationship. A relationship comes in my way, I'm for it. I'm not going to say no, because this could be the coolest guy there is. And if I'm with the coolest guy, then I'm going to be the coolest girl there is. And by the way, if you keep looking for the six foot two, blonde hair, blue eyes guy, keep looking, because it's going to be a while. <laughs> Just kidding. The guys are not here, so we can make fun of them. <clears throat> um, no discretion, like we said, in the media that I choose to partake of. No discretion in how to deal with people and how are, I allow people to deal with me. Which is something we're going to talk about too. Sometimes I just allow people to deal with me whichever way that it pleases them. Not what pleases me. Not what I think is right. If they say something that's inappropriate and I let it go, there's no discretion. Nothing... Um, there's no discernment whatsoever. I really love this verse, which in Proverbs 11, 22. If, we could, if you could see it, let's read it together, even though it's not in red. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Why? What's the relationship? What's the relationship? What does that have to do with anything? Uh, who could tell me what's the relationship? But what's, what's, what's with the story with the pig snout? Where is it always? It's always in the dirt. It's always digging in the dirt. So how can I put something valuable and always digging in the dirt? This is a woman with no discretion. Or a man or anyone with no discretion. Everything goes. Everything is in the dirt. Everything is being dug in the dirt. So how can I make the right decisions or have yani, or live the life of discretion and discernment with the grace of God? Nothing could happen or we, could, we can't attain anything unless it comes from what? From above. With the grace of God, as is mentioned in James 1.5, let's read together. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James 1.5 Ask. God give us very simple promises. Ask and shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Ask God for wisdom. God help me to make the right decisions. God help me to, to be a discerned woman or, make, or have the life of discernment. And we can learn that a lot from the saints, especially like St. Anthony. You know, if you, I don't know if you heard the story about St. Anthony. I think it's St. Anthony. I'm not mixing with someone else. But the devil came and tried to wake him up in the middle of the night. And he said, St. Anthony, wake up and pray. St. Anthony said, no, I'm not going to wake up and pray. He said, you know, but logically, why wouldn't St. Anthony want to pray? Because St. Anthony knew he had a program for himself. If he gets up in the middle of the night, it's going to ruin the rest of the day. And this was the, the devil's plan. He had the life of discernment to determine what's coming from evil or what is the right thing to do. So we pray that God gives us this life of discernment 
and make the right decisions. If I ask, not you guys, if I ask anyone that smokes, for example, and tell them, here's a cigarette, I want you to go in your church and stand in front of an altar and light up the cigarette and smoke it. You think this person, he's Coptic and he's Christian. You think he would smoke it? No. Why not? Huh? Why not? Disrespectful to what? To God. And what else? Is God only in the altar? What else? It's a holy place, right? What makes it holy? Huh? The presence of God through the body and the blood. What do we do today? Right before lunch. We all took communion. Who's inside of us? God. So I became what? A temple of God, like St. Paul said. St. Paul said, together, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? We have God inside of us. So whatever thing we ask you to do in front of this altar in the church, I cannot do. How can I do it in front of this altar? God dwells here too. He's with me every second of the day. So if I can't do it in front of the altar, how can I do it in front of this altar? If I always keep the thought in mind, will help me to make the right decisions. Will help me to take the right steps and to make a wise decision. Last point is for in this section, Yanni. We have 10 minutes. Um, crushing the stone. Do you think is as, Yanni, take my beautiful ruby here. Do you think it's still as beautiful as it originally started? It's shattered almost and it's crushed. What crushes this beautiful stone? Um, briefly, when I allow myself to live the life of impurity, without going much into the life of impurity, we're just going to go a few quick things. Um, sometimes I want to try everything in my life, even though I know how harmful it is to me, how bad it is to me. I just want to try it. What's the big deal if I do it once? What's the big deal if I just go to this party just once? You know what? I know this person who doesn't live in this coast at all, all the way in the East Coast. First year of college, first party she attended to, first drink she offered, she, she took it. Because of that one drink, she regrets the rest of her life going to that party. Why? Because she wanted to try it. A lot of times we want to try things, even though we know from experience and experience of others and the stories that we hear, and we all know, but we still want to do it anyway. Such bad experiences could crush us. Such, um, when we lose our respect to others, and this is a huge problem, that ruins our life. When I let a guy talk to me as he pleases, I lose my respect. When, you know, I'm going to share you, uh, with you as statistics that my wife shared with me. She was telling me that she read that 90% of teenage girls are asked at one point in their life to send or to do some kind of sexting or send an improper picture or improper uh, talk via the cell phone. 90%. And unfortunately, 70% of those 90% girls will respond back. That's a huge number. That's a lot of pressure on all of us. If I think, you know, it's, it's pressuring. But I lose the respect when I respond back. When I lose the respect when the guy tells me something improper, <laughs> okay, <laughs> what? What's expected, you turn around, you slap him in the face. No, we're not asking for violence. But, <laughs> but at least not smile back, at least not giggle back at him. Because that's what that doing. It's giving him the gateway, he could say this and do this. And it gives them to move on for the next step. And this sets no limits. And of course, impure relationship will shatter my life. How can I overcome the life, how to live the life of purity? Five quick things. 
because we're running out of time. Um, attack at the roots. You know what that means? When you have weeds that grow in your backyard and you bring like a scissor and you cut them. What happens in a couple of days? <laughs> they're, out, they're out again and you cut them. Do you, are you really solving the problem? No. no. But what's the best thing to do is to pull them out or spray something that kills them. I wish we could spray something on boys, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> just, a, just a joke. Um, so we need to attack at the root. If I am fighting the sin of impurity, whatever it is, thoughts, feelings, or relationship, where is the source of this problem? Figure out the source, and this is where I start from. But if I keep trying from the surface, trying to solve the problem, it's never going to happen. Two is don't feed the desire, meaning if I keep talking with my peers about it, if I keep watching the wrong media, if I always in the wrong environment, all these things will feed in my desire and the life of impurity. Junk in is what? Junk out. I feed myself bad material, guess what's going to happen? This is the bad material I'm going to live by. Three, so we said what? Two. One, what do we say? Two, don't feed your desire. Three, set a purpose and a limit. No one's going to say you cannot talk to guys. No one's going to say you cannot have feelings. But as long as there's a purpose of talking to this per person, and there's limits. There are many limits sometimes we ignore. Me, as a whole, I am a limit to other people. Personal life is a limit to other people. Things that I, I feel sometimes, and I'm, yani, once in a while I have these feelings towards this person, these are also off limits. Because I'm not sure where these feelings are coming from yet. So there's a lot of things that are off limits that we need to set the limits. I need to set the limits inside here and here and make sure they're known to the other person if they try to cross the limit. But if I don't have them set them here, how do I know if this person crossed the, crossed the lines or not? Four, escape rather than fight. Sometimes we push ourselves to a point where there's no return and all of a sudden we want to come back. Yes, there's always, a, there's always coming back, but it's easier to come back when you, or easier to run than to fight. I went to a rough high school in Jersey City. In Egypt, um, if you went to my high school, you would run, not just walk away. <laughs> well, Yanni, we're not specifically talking about this example, but we're talking about if you are about to expose yourself to something that's improper, then it's better to walk away than kind of waiting and see what's going to happen, where is this relationship going to end up in. I'll just wait six months, a year, then if it doesn't go the way, then I'm kind of testing the water, then all of a sudden I'm going to drown. But there's an old saying that running is half of bravery in Egypt. In my high school where I went to, running is 100% bravery. We see a sign of fight coming, we run, and we run fast, believe me. So sometimes we need to run rather than just waiting and getting into this fight that I can, maybe I won't be able to get over. Um, never lose hope. Does Jesus Christ always among us? Yes or no? Yes? yes? Jesus Christ, write the word Jesus Christ next to equal sign equals hope. As long as Jesus Christ exists, there's always hope. We say in the, gospel, the litany of the gospel, you are the life of us all, the hope of us all, and the salvation of us all. There's always hope. Never lose hope. No, no matter how far I went, no matter how bad things, or how awful these things I did, never lose hope. God will always have His arms open to us.
Now, remember I told you, remember this picture before? Do you remember? It's going to change slightly. Because we were, in the beginning, describing a precious stone. But now we're going to describe something even better. We're going to describe how God created us. First, we said it's very expensive. Actually, we're priceless. In the eyes of God, you are priceless. Because the price that was paid for our salvation, we cannot put a price tag on it. Can you put a price tag on the blood of Christ? We can't. We can't even imagine a number. We can't imagine anything. So in the eyes of God, we are priceless. In the eyes of God, we're very beautiful. Because God doesn't know evil and doesn't know anything but beauty. He only creates beauty. He only creates beauty. And you know what beauty is? Just like Satan explained it yesterday. Who defines beauty? Not society, not your friends, not your peers, not the media, not the economy, not what sells on TV. What defines beauty is God, because God is the one who created us beautiful in His image. Therefore, I am beautiful, you are beautiful in the image of God. I mean, in the eyes of God. Not only that you're precious, you are the most precious. Do you remember the parable of the lost sheep? <coughs> Who's good at math? All of you? I'm sure. Which is greater, 99 or 1? <laughs> it's not a hard question. <laughs> of what? Like no. I'm talking about numbers. numbers. <laughs> Which, one? <laughs> Which one is more, 99 or 1? Okay, if I am a shepherd, and logically speaking, I have 99 sheep, and one gets lost. If I go after this one, I come back, maybe I'm missing 50 more. Would I cut my losses and say, forget about the one, stick with the 99, right? That logically would say that. Right or wrong? But in the eyes of God, one equaled the 99. One small sheep that went away is equal to 99 sheep with him. That shows how much we are precious in his eyes. How valuable we are to him. We are equal, the world. one of us is equal 7 billion people. Each one of us equals 7 billion people. We are very, we are the most precious, not just precious, the most precious. We are very honorable. We are very valuable in the eyes of God. Maybe a little homework that we take with us today. Say, God, I want you to be on my side. When we stand and pray, tell them, God, I want you to be on my side. Because many times in my life, I do feel weak. I feel alone. I feel no one's helping me. I feel I want to be with you, but I really can't. So without your help, without your support, I can't do it on my own. So God, plead with him, like ask him. You know when you nag, till today you still nag your parents about things that you want? Nag God about helping us, about helping you. Nag God about being always with you. Nag God about protecting you. Ask Him, God, don't ever leave me alone for one second. If you leave me alone for one second, I could perish in a minute. But I want us every day of our life to lift up our hands, lift up our hearts and tell Him, God, I want you to keep me that precious stone that you created me from the beginning. I want you, God, to support me that I will never ruin the image that you created me in. And glory be to God forever. Amen.